All right, so today we're gonna be working with these droplets that we finished off late um, or the last time. Um, so we are gonna be working with particle systems today, and that's a that's a fun part in Blender. You use it for for everything, when you want to make grass, when you want to make rain, um, when you want to make hair, you use particle systems and stuff like this as well. So when you scatter things on on a surface, you're gonna be using particle systems most of the time. Right, so these water drops, they are quite big now and we need them to be small on the can. Two, two ways to do that, we can do it right here or we can do it later in the can, so in the particle systems. So let's just first take a look on how it's going to look in our can. Right, so if you want to add a particle system, you will just select your can and you will go to the particle part properties, which is the option below the... I'm, I'm still forgetting the name of this icon. I'm just going to call it a gear, um, even though it is not. It's like a tool, a wrench. Ah, I remember Maple. All right, so it's, this is a wrench. <laughs> the button under the wrench icon is the particle properties type. Right, so this is where you can hit that plus sign and add a new particle system. And by default, this will be set on emitter. And that basically means that if I now play my animation, um, and let me get that animation. So if I now play this, it will shoot balls um, out of my surface. So it emits objects out of my particle system, right? Um, and we don't want that in this case because we want them to be fixed on the surface and we want it to be set on hair for now. And let me see where that hair is actually going. Give me a second to find out why this is not showing. Um, it may be a little bit of an issue with this Boolean modifier, which is always the case. Um, Give me one second. Yeah, all right. So I'm going to step back real quick. <laughs> so the particle systems. We added it. There's once again a list of errors that can happen when you add this. And the main reason is usually that your modifier stack is in the wrong order. Right? So right now we've got a few modifiers applied. So we've got this um, subdivision modifier and a boolean for when we combine the little detail rich on the top with the can and then the third is the particle systems so the particle systems will now be applied after these two modifiers and that's fine um but it doesn't always work right so you can now see that it doesn't work well even let's see if it works right that's where that option is for um i don't use it a lot um, but if you go to your particle systems and if it doesn't work, if it doesn't show up right away, first things you do is open up the emission tab, open up the source tab, so the bottom one, and there will be a little checkbox called use modifier stack. And that will do exactly what I just told you. So that will make sure that the particle system will go through each of these modifier setups before it will go to the particle system so it will actually follow the steps that you did in modeling the can as well so now it's working with the right geometry so just check this little box that's it right so now we have hair so that's fine if you want to make some hairs on your particles so if you want to make hairs on your can you can end it like this but if you want something else you go to the render tab and we don't want to render it as a path a path is what you use when you want hair. We want to render this as a collection, right? Because we have three, three of these water drops that we added into the raindrops collection last time. Um, and that's what we want to use. So we want to use that, where is it? That collection, render as a collection. And the instance collection is going to be the raindrops. So just select that and you will see we get some raindrops on our can. They are very big. So we have to fix that, right? So we've got a scale option right there in the render tab that we can just swipe down, for example, like this. And we can add some scale randomness as well. So we can get some variation in the scale of those particles, just like that. All right, um, now they are scattered onto very fixed places, right? So they are on the line here there lines there and uh, we don't want it we want it to be more random right so you can see when you go to the source so the same place where we enabled this modifier stack there is a distribution setting that is by default set on jittered and we can set it on random 
and it will randomly scatter it all over the surface of the can. And remember the last time we added a vertex group, right? So we added a vertex group called raindrops. Um, which we pretty much defined in what part of the can we're going to be scattering those raindrops on. So that's what we're going to be using in these particle settings. So go all the way to the bottom in your particle settings tab, go to the vertex groups, and we're going to set this density to the raindrop. Just like that. So now we've got these particles, these water drops all over the can, except for the bottom part. It's beautiful. All right, now, last issue we need to change the rotation. And as always, a little something in Blender. Um, the rotation of particles in a particle system is always, in my, in my case, in my, my opinion, it's always a little bit random, always something that I need to tweak, right? So we can go to the particle tab. And first things first, we're gonna go to the render tab, uh, right there. And I want this collection of raindrops to only pick one random raindrop each time, right? So pick random, select that, which will basically make sure that you won't be um, rendering out um, a bunch of these water drops, um, but it will pick a random one. And so now we're gonna fix that rotation. And to do that, we need to tweak the rotation of our actual raindrops that we're using. So of these through three. So I'm gonna select all of them by holding shift. I'm gonna hit tab. I'm going to hit A to select everything. And you can see on the can that you have now selected those particles as well, right? Because you're using this in this particle system. And we want to set the rotation to individual origins, right? So this little icon on top, we want to set this to individual origins, which basically means that each of these objects will rotate around their own origin. And you can see the little origin points right there. So I'm going to press R and Y. And we're going to rotate that until we have a satisfied position. Now, the issue is that we can't really see when it is um, at a good rotation. So I'm going to escape this for now. And I'm going to zoom in on my can. Right? And now we're still going to press R and Y. And let's see. If we press R, Y, 90, is it the right rotation? It is not. So escape that and press R, X, 90. Right, so you can now see we've got this, the right axis. So our X is the right axis for rotation because the, the particle system is now rotated in the right direction compared to the can. It is just in the reverse direction. So instead of having our X 90, we need our X minus 90. And here you can see it is now rotated perfectly, right? One issue is that it goes inside of our can. Right, and remember what I said last tutorial, um, your particles will be scattered on their origin points, right? And you can see that the origin is inside of a water drop. And in order to make our water drops appear on the can instead of inside of the can partly, we need this origin to be at the base of the water drop. So right there. Okay, so what I can do is because they all pretty much have the same origin points compared to the lowest points is we can just press G, Y, and just move the mesh to the right, like that. So now our origin point is right at the base of our water drops for each water droplet. And now when I look at my particle system on the can, you can see that it's now placed on the side of the can beautifully. Nice. Right, so let's press tab, go out of that, and let's tweak some of these particle settings. So select your can, go to the particle tab, and let's play around with the number a little bit because there's a lot of um, water drops on this can right now. I want this to be a little bit less, so I'm just gonna scroll the number in the emission tab down to something that looks better, right? Something like that perhaps, and maybe even the size has to be a little bit lower, right? So we have the scale is already 0 0.01. Um, so to move this with smaller increments, with smaller steps, we can hold shift in Blender and then just swipe it to the left and then it will move with lower increments. Unless in this case, we are already at the lowest possible, which is 0 .0, or 0 0.01, sorry. We have to manually pretty much just type that in. So for example, 0 0.005. All right, that's too little. 0 0.07, better, better. 
And let's add some numbers then as well. And you can see me playing around with these particle settings. And that's pretty much what it is, right? For each particle system that you add, whether it's going to be water droplets or grass or rain, you will always have to tweak some of these settings until it looks um, like what you want. But for now, I think these water droplets look quite nice. So let's actually get to some of the material settings. And that's the fun part. We're going to get into the rendering part now. So I'm going to grab my back plane. So just select it. And I'm going to press G and Y to move that out of the way. And I'm going to press numpad zero. And that will bring you into the camera view. Right? So you will always start with a camera in your scene. And if you want to see where it is, you can press numpad zero. Now for the people with a laptop, numpad zero is going to be tricky. And I think I already told this in the first tutorial. Um, go to edit preferences and go to your key mapping and search for camera. And for numpad zero, so view camera, just set that to, for example, the zero button on your keyboard. That's what I do when I work on a laptop. I just change the view camera from numpad zero to simple zero. Right? So then you have to use zero when we are going to be using numpad zero. Save your preferences, of course. Click this away. So this is a camera view. You can select that frame. So you see a little dotted line, which is your camera. You can select it by simply clicking. And it turns orange, like everything in Blender. Um, and now we can move this camera around. For example, with the G, you can rotate it around. And you can pretty much do the same thing for objects and cameras, the same way of moving them around. Scaling pretty much works as well, I guess. So you can inverse the, the scaling. Not sure why you want to do that. Um, but the way I usually just move my camera around it is with Shift F. Shift F basically allows you to move your camera around as you will be playing a first person game, right? So I can now move my camera around with the mouse and I can press W, A, S, and D to pretty much just fly around through my scene, right? So I can just fly around my can if I want with the same shortcuts I would use when I was playing a game on the computer. So that's how you can move your camera around very freely and I use this for pretty much everything. Right, so let's get a nice camera view set up now. And I want to see the can like so. Pretty much left click to apply and I want something on the bottom, something like a plane. So it has to stand on something. So we're going to be adding a plane. So make sure to press shift S and move your cursor to the world origin. And um, so your new objects that you will add are located on that point. So on the world origin, press shift A mesh plane and move that a little bit down. So it is on the bottom end of the plane or sorry, on the bottom end of the can. Press numpad three to go into side view and see exactly how these two are placed on top of each other. So move this down a little bit and let's kill this up now. It has to, it has to be nice and big. Now press numpad zero to see how it looks in your camera view. What I'm usually trying to do is to have um, the plane just outside of my camera view. So just like that. And I'm going to press GX to just move it back a little bit like so. So the, the, the front end of that plane is still in camera view. I'm going to press tab. I'm going to press two and I'm going to select this back edge. So that edge right there on the back of my plane. And I'm going to press E and Z and extrude that up like so. Just like a wall. It's now pretty much a wall. And you can see that this is now no longer inside of my camera frame. So I'm going to press A, S, Y. And just scale that up in the Y axis a little bit. So it is outside of my camera bounce. And now comes the magic. If I go to rendered view right now. And that's it. So there's a, there's a little button on the top right. Called viewport shading. And which basically shows you how the render will look if you would render this out right now. Um, so this is what it would look like. So I'm going to move away these water drops real quick. So select all of them by holding shift and press G and Y and just move them away a little bit. Same for this plane right there with a the red bull icon. Just press G and move it away. Um, now if you press Ctrl B, yes, another shortcut in Blender. Um, press Ctrl B, you can make a little box around your render frame like that. And that will basically mean that once we go into that rendered view and it, I don't think it's working for Eevee, but once we go to cycles, which is the render engine that we're going to be using. Um, and actually let me do that right away. So go to that render tab on the top, right? 
So underneath your tool icons, <laughs> and these are tools, um, you have your render properties. And the first option is the render engine. And you've got three options. And EV is the default setting, which is a very fast renderer in Blender. So if you have a lower end computer, you may want to be looking into EV rendering. And we can also cover that later in tutorials. And um, you've got the workbench, which is basically the most poor way of shading your objects, which is basically if I go back to my solid viewport like this, this is basically what it will render out um, in the workbench. So that's not, I use this when I want to test an animation, for example. So the speed of an animation, um, if an animation actually works, um, that's when I will use workbench because it can render out an animation very quickly and you can see if the timing and stuff is right. Um, but other than that, I use cycles all the time. So set it to cycles and then go into your rendered view. And I will see that that, uh, that square that you just drew around your scene will now limit Blender from rendering anything outside of your camera view, which is just something that saves you a lot of um, system, um, system performance. So next up, if you have a GPU, set your device from CPU to GPU. That will just make it that much faster. Um, so that's what I'm always using. Now for the rest of the render settings, we don't really have to worry about it for now, right? So let's go to the next step, which is how to make a render look nice. Well, we need a lighting, a nice lighting setup. We need materials and we need the right reflections and stuff. Um, because right now we only have one plane. But to make a product render, and this is so one easy step that you can do with pretty much every render, um, if you want to showcase an object, for example, you can select your um, ground and wall that we just made, press tab, press two, and select this little edge, that corner edge, because right now there's a very hard separation in those two, right? They go um, from flat to like vertical, just like that. But I want it to be nice and curved. So press tab once again, so select that edge and press control B to bevel this and make it nice and big and scroll up a few times, make it nice and smooth. Left click to apply, press tab to go out of that view, right mouse and shape this smooth. Right, so now we have a very nice transition between the foreground and the background. So between the floor and the wall, which is something you also see when people are using cameras for um, product photography. So product um, cinematics, they will usually have a very wide background. And the way they achieve this is by just having a very strong light that is placed on a paper that they pretty much just fold like this, right? That's how they get that look. And same thing we use in Blender. Right, so how do we add materials? Well, it's actually quite easy. Um, what we wanna do now is add a new window. And this is something that I struggled a lot with in Blender, just adding new windows and closing them again. But there is a small option. If you move your mouse to the top right corner of a window, you will see this little plus sign up here. And I'm wondering if you can see this or not, but if you move your mouse to just the top right, all the way to the top right of one window of Blender, so not in the, the, the cross little cross icon on the top bar of Blender, but just in that small window of your viewport you can see this little cross. And if you left click that and swipe to the left, you can add a new window, just like that. And that's something you just have to do a few times and then it will go smoothly. And now you can, for example, make the left one bigger or the right one bigger by simply just dragging that middle bar to the left or right. And the beauty with this is that we can now set this right window into a different view, right? So there's a little button on the top left of each window that will pretty much define what kind of view you will have, what kind of window it will be. So if you click on that, we can now change this window to the shade editor. Left click, and you will see that it will now get an entire new interface, um, which is something that we will have to get used to as well. Right, so if you want a new material, there's a little button on the top right that says add a new material. Another way to add a material is to go to the material tab. So the material properties on the bottom right, it will be this little spherical icon with um, black and white spots. If you left click on that, you can also add a new material. 
So let's click it and you will see that you now add material dot zero zero one and you will have some new nodes in this window, right? So this is where things can get tricky. By default, once you create a new material, you will have one material output and a principled BSDF. And in most cases, that is already plenty. That's all you need, right? So the material output defines what your material will show, whether it's going to be a surface, uh, which the, is what we have right now, or if it's going to be a volume. And the volume is something you use, for example, for clouds. You can use it for water. You can use it for fog. You can use it for smoke. Everything that is, for example, a gas or a liquid, that is what you can use a volume for. And we'll get into that later. Um, and usually a surface is what you need. When you just want a solid object with a material, then you can use the, vo the surface. Now, the principal BSDF node is the node you will use the most, most likely. So this is what contains all the information of what your object is going to look like, right? So we can go through a few of these settings. Um, the top two are pretty much what, um, what systems are used to make your material. Um, I have never changed those settings, never. So I don't expect that you have to at any time soon. Um, I just leave those two at default, right? Then after that, everything you can change. Starting, of course, the base color. Um, the base color is very simple. You just click on the little white part and you can just create any color you want. So right now we're changing the background color of our can. So if we want red, we can set this at red. If you want a darker red, you can slide this right part down. Right? So you have a lot of control there. Um, if you want a specific color that you found somewhere online, you can fill in the hex, for example. So you can fill in the code and it will become that code. Beautiful. The rest of these settings um, is something we will get into once we shade this can, right? So for the background, I usually go for something very rough. So there's a roughness setting in the material tab as well. Um, and if you swipe this all the way down, it will become very reflective. So you can see the reflection of the can, for example, in that floor plane. If you turn this all the way up, it will become very rough and everything will be rougher. You will see no reflections and the shader will get a little rougher as well. Um, so it's a very, very much based on personal preference. Do you want a very reflective surface or do you want a very rough surface um, or something in between, of course. Uh, for this one, I am pretty much going to leave this rough just to start off, right? It's very easy to change this later on. Now for the can, and this is where it's going to be fun. Select your can and add a new material like we just did. And now we don't really want this to be a color. Well, we do, but we also want this label to be on top. And this is where you can add your own label, right? So what I did for Red Bull, you can do for whatever label you want. Um, but you will have to set up a base material first, right? because this label is only going to be applied at the parts where this label is visible. So the top part and the bottom part, they will be plain and I guess it's aluminum. Um, so that's just going to be aluminum. So that's the base material that we're going to be setting up. Now, how do we add a metallic material? It's very easy. There's a metallic slider right in the principal BDF. So at the default note you get, there's a metallic slider that if you slide this all the way up, your material will get metallic. And this is already looking metallic. And now all that's left is to play around with the roughness settings. So if you swipe this all the way down, you can see you pretty much get a chrome surface, a perfect chrome surface. And if you swipe that up a little bit, um, or sorry, down, no, the roughness up, you can see that you just get some of that roughness back, right? So you will have to match that to the reference image a little bit. And this aluminum is not completely smooth. It has some roughness, um, which is usually the case for aluminum. Um, so we want some roughness as well. And we can even change the color. So if you want a darker color, you can do that as well for metallic materials. Make it a color. Um, but I just want this to be gray. And quite light. Something like that. And what happens if you make a material metallic? and the roughness low, 
it will reflect things from the environment. Right, so you can see that it now reflects the bottom of this plane. So you see some red values coming back into that um, can. But it will also reflect, for example, this light way harder. So this light point that is in your scene by default, it will reflect that very hard, as you can see with the white, the white part right there. Um, so it is very important that if you add a very reflective material, um, you have your environment set up to reflect something as well. So right now it only affects, uh, reflects gray. And how do I know that? Well, if I go to my world settings, so my world properties, the color of the world is gray. So if I look around in my scene, everything is gray. So this is what is going to be reflected into my can as well. It's all of this grayness. And that's quite boring. So we can change this color. For example, to whatever we want, you can see that the can reflection will change with that as well. So remember that whenever you make a reflective object, um, the, the environment matters a lot, right? So we can change this, make it lighter, make it darker. Uh, but what is more fun is to add a fake environment around the can in which it can get reflections. Um, so what we can do is instead of using a color, we can click this little yellow button, we can use an environment texture. So click on that and right away your can will turn pink as will your environment. And what that means in Blender is that there's pretty much a texture missing. So anytime something of yours turns pink without actually making the color pink, it will basically mean that you have a texture that Blender can't find anymore. Right? So right on a Right now, we don't have a texture set up, it's, um, which is why it is pink. But if you, for example, had a material or a texture first that suddenly turns pink, it will mean that it is gone or that you moved it to a different place, right? So if you download a texture, um, I usually save it in my download map because I'm an idiot. And then once in a free few weeks, I delete my entire download folder which will also delete those textures. And then whenever I reopen one of those files, all of those textures will turn pink. And that is because those textures are just no longer there. They're gone, right? So whenever you download textures, make sure that you save them on the right location. Don't be like me. Right, so let's actually open something up now in this environment tab. And well, go to wherever you want, actually. We don't have anything downloaded yet. And this is where I will share the first awesome website with you guys. So, internet, Google Chrome, whatever browser you want to use, um, you should be able to see that right now. Um, there is a website called polyhaven.com. And this is the most beautiful website for Blender ever. And for a lot more programs as well, not only for Blender. Um, you can basically go to assets and download free models. You can download all of those models. You can go to assets, go to textures. You can download all of these textures for free. Apply them on your models just like that. Um, but the fun part is they also have HDRIs. And an HDRI basically means the environment, right? So it's a 3D scan of an environment. And they have a lot, they have 600 HDRIs of all kinds of environments that you can use, right? So make sure to search for one that actually matches the environment that you wanna make. So right now I wanna make a product render, which basically means that I would make this product render in a studio environment. And there's like this studio setting on the left as well. And um, so this is basically the studio 3D scans that you can use. Right, so let's pick something nice, um, maybe something Christmassy. Christmas Photo Studio, of course they have one. So I can just click that one and download. There we go, it's downloading now. By default, it's set on 4K. Uh, 4K is basically plenty. Um, if you want the reflections to be high quality, so for example, if you have a Chrome object or a mirror and it has to reflect the environment perfectly, you may need to up this to 8K or even 16K because the environment gets low detail very quickly, right? So 4K will do for now. If you download this, you can go back to Blender. So you can open an environment, go to your download folder and search for uh, 
well, I am just gonna search for HDR because that's the file format it downloads. And I have downloaded a lot during my time in Blender. These are not nearly all of them, but I'm gonna look for the Christmas one and I'm just gonna open this up. There we go. Right away, you can see that the reflections are very different compared to what we started with. And that is because if I now rotate my camera, you can see that we have this fake environment set up in our scene. Right, so a fake Christmas tree, fake lighting, fake walls, everything is fake, but it will add the lighting of that environment to your scene, right? So it will act as if there is actually lighting coming from these windows, lighting coming from that window. If there's lighting coming from this, um, this fire, from the Christmas lights. So it's all being applied to your scene and so will the reflections. So if I go to my camera view, select my can, and set this roughness all the way to zero, you can then see that it is actually starting to reflect parts of that environment. And one more thing that I will teach you before we end this tutorial is you can change your shader editor from object to world, right? And now you can see your HDRI is in a node as well, same as for materials. And if you select this node, and before we're gonna do this, we're gonna go to edit and to preferences, and we're going to go to the add-ons tab and we're going to search for Node Wrangler, right? And you will find this Node Wrangler setting. Just check the little box in front and save your preferences. Close it down. And now if you select this node right there and press Ctrl T, just like that, it will add two more nodes. And those nodes are basically the mapping nodes, which will allow you to move around the texture right so now we can get an option to move it around as a location rotation or scale and what i usually do in hdri is i play around with the z rotation and um, because that will define which way your lighting will hit your can right so from which point the light from the windows is coming and stuff like that so if i rotate this now you can see that the reflections in the can are rotating as well and that is because you you are rotating the environment itself, right? And you can see that it's also changing the way it lights the scene. You can see the shadows changing, for example, if I rotate this around and how light the object is and how light the background is. You can see it all changing with the rotation of that environment. So make sure that you play around with those settings because it's a lot of fun. <laughs> so next up, I'm just gonna select my can real quick, go back to object shading and I'm gonna just add some roughness back. Like that, looking perfect. And when we have that, we can even just remove that initial light blender has. So the default light, um, just look, at, uh, look for it. It will be this little ball floating around in your 3D space. Select it and press delete. There we go. And now go back to your shader editor and now your entire scene is basically being um, a light um, being um, lit up by these environment texture, right? So there are no lights at all, only an environment texture. And that will add a lot of realism to any render you make ever. So, so remember the website polyhaven.com because that's why you're gonna be looking for a lot of these things. All right, so um, right now, um, I'm gonna do one more thing just for the hell of it. Right, because we need some water materials. And <laughs> there's a very easy way to do this. Just select one of your water droplets, add a new material. All right, well, we don't want the principal PSDF for this one. So we're gonna select it, and press delete. Now we can press Shift A to look for a new node and press enter to search. And we're gonna search for a glass, a glass PSDF, right? and just swipe that in and glass note, all that it is, it's just basically a note that can add transparency and an index of reflection to your material. And the index of reflection is what we need. So I'm gonna connect this to the surface, just connect those balls and you can see right away, you can get some kind of a transparent material. Um, now 1.45 is the index of reflection used for glass, but for water, the index of reflection is 1.333 and then some more threes, but that won't matter. 
right? So you can see that it changes the, the look a little bit, but water has this index of reflection, which is basically a way that defines how the light is being bent once it enters your object, right? And we can, for example, up this roughness and it will become rougher. I'm just gonna leave that quite low, like so. And now I'm just gonna duplicate, or not duplicate, just link the other water, water droplets to this one so it matches the materials, right? So select those other water droplets, hold shift, select the second one, keep holding shift and select the one you already shaded last, hit control L and link your materials. And now it's all the same. And if you go back to your um, camera view, numpad zero or zero, depending on if you're a laptop or not, and now if you zoom in, you can see that your water droplets are now actual water droplets. They're no longer white. They actually have that water material, right? And they are now resting on your can nicely. And it actually looks like water. And you can see that these water droplets are also reflecting the environment. So you have got some of these red backgrounds coming back, but you also have some strong um, black parts, for example, where it reflects the environment. So the HDRI that we downloaded. Right, so the HDRI is so important and adds so much realism and reflections to your scene. Um, it is something that you just have to remember to use pretty much the most as you can, right? Um, because that's how you achieve realism. You need an environment that is real as well. So I think I'm gonna end that right there. So next time we can have that custom label added on the can um, and follow up the other steps as well. Um, so I think, yeah, that, that's, that's already nice. We played around with materials. That's a good start. And particle systems. Um, so I hope it was clear to follow. Um, if you have any questions, let me know right now. And I'll try to answer them today. <laughs> Otherwise, you can always post your questions in the, um, the Blender class section of Discord. And I'll look at it this week. Um, are there any questions? No, not really. It was pretty clear, and uh, I also like what you did with uh, the the surface or the background. Yeah, that you also make this uh, this rounding in the background because now I know how this works. Because lately I see it more and more, and I already saw it from you in the beginning with the baked potatoes. These type of backgrounds. Mm -hmm. And last I was minting another NFT, and I did, and I saw the same, and I was like, hey, what the fuck? Why why are you doing this? But now you also explain why with the lighting and everything is better. Yeah, this curve. So yeah, it gives another point of view, let's say it like this. And I did work in school a lot with lumen and light, but never with the curves, let's say it like this. Ah, yeah, nice. No, good to know. Uh, it's definitely something I've used for the baked potatoes for the backgrounds, because it will just make your background look smooth while even keeping those shadows nice and, and crisp. So yeah, that's definitely something to, to keep in mind. Um, something you can use for, for a lot of stuff in Blender for sure. Um, anything else? Maybe you, you, Bull Vader. I'm not sure if you can talk right now. That's fine. Um, all right. If there aren't any more questions, then I'm going to round this up. I also got to leave in about five minutes. Um, so thank you all for watching. This has been recorded, so I will make sure to um, to set that online as well in case you have to rewatch it or for other people if they couldn't make it to this live session. Um, and then next week we're going to be focusing on how to add custom textures to your objects and how to make them match your objects. Um, that's a very, very fun part for sure. Um, so that's pretty much it. I'm going to give you some, some homework for the next class, by the way. I skipped it this week because we had Christmas in between, of course. <laughs> but for next week, I'm gonna make sure to add some kind of a, some kind of a quest, side quest, so you all have something to watch or something to do. Um, yeah, right. So I see actually, Sylvester had the hdrmaps.com website linked in the Blender Tips Help discussion section as well. So that's a website that you can also look at to find those HDRIs, so those environments. Um, so there are like 127 there, it says, and there are 600 on Polyhaven. So together, there must be one that you can use for what you're trying to achieve. All right.
um, have a great day. If there are any questions later, just make sure to uh, wrap me up. Thank you for your time. Bye bye, everybody. And welcome, Hazy, for the last few minutes. Welcome, Hazy. Oh, hello. Sorry, I had some stuff I had to deal with. <laughs> <laughs> it's totally fine. All right. Um, I'm going to pop out now. Um, if there are any questions that are coming up later, you can always ask them. And tomorrow, um, I'm going to be working on the comic book. But during that time, I'm also going to open up the um, the coffee shop for anyone who has questions or just wants some feedback on their work. I will be chilling in the coffee shop um, for the time that I'm working on the comic book as well. So you can just pop in, say hi, ask your questions or show me some work uh, on which you want feedback. Or yeah, just for a quick chat, whatever you want, I'll be there. I'll let you all know when I'm going to be working on it. Nice. Let's go. Yeah. All right. Bye-bye.